Hey guys, what's up? This is Chad Haig here in Southern India. I'd like to start a series of videos on Hans Georg Gadamer's Truth and Method, a very long, very dense, but very important work on hermeneutics and indeed one of the most important books uh, to have ever been written on that topic. And I'd like to reflect the structure of the book itself, which is divided into three parts by doing a series of three videos. Uh, this first video um, covering part one of the book. Now, the title itself indicates that he's interested in the relation between the human sciences and the natural sciences. Obviously, the natural sciences had have a very familiar scientific method and a very particular notion of truth, but it's questionable whether the methodology and standard of truth familiar to the natural sciences are fully applicable to the human sciences or at all. In fact, it might be misguided inherently to speak of a method at all in the human sciences. And further, is scientific truth simply an inapplicable standard to apply to the kind of truth that you find in, say, the hermeneutical interpretation of classical texts, although it would also be uh, misguided to say that there's no truth at all in such a process. Natural sciences, for example, have these defining features like induction, regularity, and the instantiation of universal laws, but the human sciences deal with the individual in a different way, whereas the natural sciences deal with an individual as one who confirms some universal law. In the human sciences, you deal with the individual as a unique historical concreteness. And yet you still must resist the temptation to describe this merely negatively as the inexact human sciences compared to the exact natural sciences. And above all, the difference between seeking out universal principles and treating unique events is going to show why there is this conflict which must simply lead Gadamer to reconceptualize, I would argue, the um, human sciences according to hermeneutics rather than any futile attempt to um, appropriate the methodology and standard of truth of the natural sciences. And interestingly enough, in this first part, he will primarily seek to do this by overturning the influence of Kant's third critique, the critique of judgment, and the notion of aesthetic taste um, and genius, which you have in that work. And he'll do this in order to try to revive a hermeneutical understanding of truth. And he begins this discussion by actually examining the German term Bildung, which we would translate in English into culture, to show how in the human sciences, since that's where you deal with cultural phenomena, you're dealing with a different type of subject matter than the kind of physical objectivity which could be submitted to a scientific method. For example, with Bildung or culture, you don't so much have a procedure or a technical construction as you have what has come into being through growing out of an inner process of formation and cultivation. You can see this in traditional notions related to building, like tact, common sense, the old idea of a wise man. These defy the type of rigid expectations of a scientific methodology built upon universal laws. It is significant, therefore, to note that common sense plays no role in Kant's theory, not even in a logical sense. Kant's notion of transcendental doctrine of judgment, for example, is explained by schematism rather than by the older notion of a sensus communis or the old Aristotelian notion of common sense. Paradoxically, although Kant's aesthetics favored a theory of reflective judgment in that Kant said um, when you view a great work of art, you don't have a determinative judgment that subsumes the intuition under a universal concept. In other words, if you um, witness a great piece of music by Mozart, you don't say, oh, I totally rationally comprehended that because I had the concept readily available to understand it. You actually don't understand great works of art by Mozart or great paintings or great novels. Instead, you have a type of reflective judgment where there's a type of free play of the faculties precisely because there's not a conceptual restriction of understanding. And that's Kant's theory, of course, in the uh, third critique. And yet, Gadamer says that um, he 
um, still maintain that the aesthetic judgment implies a type of universal agreement on sensory rather than conceptual grounds. So for Kant, the true sense of community is precisely that of taste. And this is largely because for Kant, although there is no universal concept to tell you that um, Mozart, for example, is better than Britney Spears, you could still have this sense that it would be universally recognized that that is the case. And of course, taste is the only thing that allows you to provide that type of um, feeling as though it is universal, even though you know that conceptually it's not. And the interesting thing is that before Kant, um, taste traditionally applied more to moral than to aesthetic concerns. Kant's appropriation of taste for aesthetic concerns, um, however, opened the floodgates for the artist of the work himself, therefore to take on the status of a genius who is endowed with talent almost by happenstance. There is no need to provide a rational explanation for why Mozart's work is brilliant. Um, one can simply appeal to the notion of taste to explain the appreciation of it, and appeal to the notion of genius to explain the creation of it. However, Kant's emphasis on taste and genius, or the brilliant creativity which is irreducible to set rules, in which it's just a matter of chance whether a genius like Mozart or Cervantes or Rembrandt is born, this resulted in a type of radical subjectivization which paradoxically ended up discrediting theoretical knowledge of any kind except that of the natural sciences. The end result of this radical subjectivization in Kant was that the human sciences were forced to appropriate the methodology of the natural sciences in order to even conceptualize themselves. It even became questionable whether art, for example, had any truth at all, if truth itself had to be defined by the restricted definition of natural scientific truth. And it became common to hear um, professors to this day, for example, say things like, well, there's no line in poetry because there's no truth in poetry. It's just poetry. And Gadamer finds this notion that there's no truth in the interpretation to be highly problematic. Um, and the interesting thing about the trajectory that's set in Afrikan is that Kant himself kind of acknowledged that taste lacks any significance as knowledge. And in fact, he um, argued that cases in which you do have something like conceptual knowledge in a judgment of beauty are actually kind of lower than ones where you don't. For example, he had this distinction between free and dependent beauty in which dependent beauty has a concept. For example, you could have a beautiful man, and therefore you have the concept of a man to tell you what it is. There's a beautiful animal, there's a beautiful building, there's a beautiful tree. You have beauty, but you also have a concept to where you understand what that is. But Kant thought of this largely negatively as a case where the concept actually limits the aesthetic pleasure. And Therefore, the trajectory that's set in after Kant would reflect this in a different way. There were calls for a return to Kant, um, but these largely occurred against the Hegelian tendency to view art in terms of writing the history of worldviews. In addition, you had the Neo-Kantians, who favored aesthetic feeling as that which heightens the feeling of life, or Lebensgefühl, and this was built out of the desire for a shift from transcendental neutrality to instead erlebnis or life against the cold rationalism of the enlightenment and the ugliness of industrialism. The very term erlebnis is kind of mysterious, however, in that the first known occurrence in Gadamer's time of the term was in one of Hegel's letters in which he was describing some experience he had while traveling. There was an older term, of course, erleben, which meant to be alive when something happened, and that is arguably why Hegel appropriated, or I guess coined this new term. And Erlebnis therefore came to be linked with a notion of life, particularly the infinite life manifest in finite art. Mere concepts therefore come to be opposed to this life. In addition, there's a type of hermeneutical circle, which is significant for this notion of Erlebnis because there's an interplay between a particular lived experience and the whole of that person's life, to which it relates as a part. In addition, there are really extreme experiences of adventure, which lets life as a whole 
be felt by the subject. Therefore, before the 19th century, poetry was largely thought of together with rhetoric, and you have this older notion of like, you know, hermeneutics in rhetoric, which is largely discarded um, in the 19th century due to the separation, because as a result of Kant, rhetoric comes to be devalued, since after all, the genius is one who creates just unconsciously. He doesn't need rules. You certainly don't need this um, old um, science um, from the ancient and medieval era to explain it. And still, however, the term aesthetic consciousness remains unclear and has no doubt suffered from precisely this historical trend of the genius and taste. In a certain sense, consciousness itself has come to be seen more and more as something reducible to psychological explanation. And there were people openly arguing within the philosophical community in Gadamer's time to just leave that to neuroscientists. Don't dabble in transcendental attempts at conscious, to explain consciousness. The psychological perception as the organism responding to a stimulus is, however, rather inappropriate to apply to the kind of consciousness which Gadamer seeks to understand. In hermeneutical interpretation, for example, you never simply mirror what is objectively there. Understanding had to have already understood something as something in order to even begin the process of dealing with it. The aesthetic is therefore something other than presence at hand in Heidegger's sense. Since a circular interplay between part and whole is required, this is later on the hermeneutical circle in which you can only begin to understand the whole, if, uh, excuse me, you can only begin to understand the part. If you already have some grasp of the whole, the whole is not therefore inductively built up one piece at a time, a process that finishes when you put all of the pieces together. Rather, you have to have some notion of whole even to begin. Pure seeing without bias is therefore merely an abstraction at best. Perception in the sense that some people meant to purify it scientifically always actually includes meaning. And we can only do justice to this difference between scientific objective truth and hermeneutical truth by actually overcoming Kant's radical subjectivization of the aesthetic. Therefore, chapter two, the ontology of the work of art and its hermeneutic significance, adopts this notion of playing um, to try to help us understand this. So if you see a group of people playing a game like soccer, or in India, the most uh, popular sport is cricket, the mode is more like something is happening than it is like a subject executing a task. The only subject, really, if you could speak of one, is the game itself. In a certain sense, art is just the transformation of this plane into a structure. This is precisely, Gadamer says, the transformation into the true. Though, of course, this kind of truth has nothing to do with scientific factuality. Darstellung, or presentation, is therefore revelation rather than mere imitation, and is the mode of being of the work of art. This really does make sense because the true nature of playing is self-presentation. That's what you're doing if you're out there caught up in the game. It would be absurd to other, uh, argue otherwise if you just observe athletes getting caught up in the uh, flow of the game itself. You can't really call that, however, a subjective aesthetic judgment because it's part of the event of being as it occurs in presentation. Okay? There is therefore something of an originary unity which might be moved out of accidentally to, for example, reflect on an actor's performance in the play, but this is merely secondary to what is originarily a unity. Therefore, the interplay between play and art and the emphasis on an event also tie into the finitude of historical existence. Yet this is precisely the dimension which rules out any idea of having only one correct interpretation and all the others simply being wrong. Being cannot be separated, he claims, from presentation. Every repetition of the work of art is as original as the work itself. You could consider, for example, a recurring festival. Each time it comes annually, it still is really it, even if it's a festival that has been celebrated for thousands of years. The same holds for drama and the performance of a piece of music. Its essence is to be something different each time, yet this requires us to move out into the realm of considering temporality as such. One temporal consideration is Kierkegaard's notion that one cannot understand Christ's existence from a detached and objective distance many centuries later. One must actually become contemporaneous with him. 
However, Kierkegaard did not mean this in a sense of literally existing at the same time, rather in the sense of bringing two moments together. This is what Gadamer will also be interested in, in the concept of a fusion of horizons in hermeneutical interpretation. Similarly, the being of the work of art is contemporaneity. Gadamer calls this, as I just said, the fusion of horizons in hermeneutics. Therefore, it's also inappropriate to call this a subjective feeling since the event overwhelms man and sweeps him away. This is the problem with Kant's overemphasis on um, that radical subjectivization of it. Therefore, one might argue that in the ancient Greek tragedies, this took the form of a finite man overwhelmed by fate. This book is not only, however, about art, it's also about ontology and works with the goal of acquiring a horizon embracing both art and history. Let's dwell a bit longer on presentation and art. We often think of a picture as a copy, but actually the two are not at all the same thing. A copy is intrinsically self-effacing, because it is only a means to an end of resembling something else. But a picture is not that, because it's not a means to an end, but something with its own being. The event of being actually happens in the picture, rather than reduce the picture to a mere object of somebody's aesthetic consciousness. A picture, therefore, contains an indissoluble connection with its world, in which it has to actually take place. And therefore, in general, occasional art is art that is intended for an occasion. The musical score, for example, is not the musical piece itself. It is merely a set of instructions to facilitate bringing about the event in which it will occur in the occasion of a performance. The work of art is therefore something which always belongs to the present. This is true even for a picture. The work of art has something sacred about it which must not be profaned. It is no coincidence that the term vandalism originally referred to the destruction of works of art. A picture is therefore neither a sign or a mere indication, nor is it a symbol or a substitution, because in a certain sense it, it's halfway between the two, and in a certain sense it does both. Because presentation is an event of being, it is to be contrasted with a mere event of experience. That's something which occurs only once, such as at the moment of creation by the artist who is a genius. Above all, Gadamer resists the idea that interpretation should consist of nothing more than an attempt to reconstruct the procedure of creation of the contents of consciousness inherent in the artist at the moment he or she created the work of art. Therefore, presented as an event of being, um, to be presented as an event of being, I should say, is to be contrasted with the more intuitive model of an experiential event, such as one um, that occurs at the one moment of creation and is then only repeated each time it is reconstructed in the mind of the viewer or reader. For example, you might think that Don Quixote happened in Cervantes' mind when he wrote it, and for each of us it's just kind of like a, a an imperfect repetition of that original time that Don Quixote happened. The problem with the idea of, say, silent reading is that oral tradition is typically a performance out loud. Even if one does happen to read quietly to oneself, each reading is, in that case, still something of a performance. Or more precisely, each performance is an interpretation of the text. Therefore, reading gives you the presence of the past only in a certain process of understanding, which transforms something dead into something alive. Hermeneutical consciousness is not, however, limited to the aesthetic. Rather, the text will propose, this text will propose a new understanding of understanding based around an event in which meaning occurs and expand this to the sort of general notion of ontology. This will therefore extend to all statements. And hermeneutics is a fitting name for this because Hermes was the god who unlocked content, which is estranged from its original meaning and the world. Therefore, he's largely interested in critiquing Schleiermacher's notion of reconstruction of the original in understanding, or the rediscovery of something in the artist's mind in order to reproduce the original process of production. Understanding, in this view, would literally just become second creation, which is always secondary to the first creation. But this could only even be possibly true if historicity were not an issue. But of course, after Heidegger, especially, we all know that the historicity of our own being and finitude as well, would make this project futile to even attempt. We must instead adopt a new hermeneutics that extends to both aesthetic and historical consciousness, because the truth that manifests itself in both is our goal.